How do you do, boys and girls? This is Edward October, and I'm here to say a few words in defense of our true crime podcast. It is not true, as has been claimed over the last year, that our true crime podcast is filled with dribble and slang. Let me reassure you that Jen and Cam keep their mouths quite dry, and any dribbling is promptly edited out. I'm told that some parents have advised their unpopular teenagers to stream our true crime podcast in the hopes that they would learn the latest slang popular among young people. They were doomed to disappointment as the teenagers emerged from their phones, visibly rattled, but only versed in slang which would be unintelligible to anyone younger than Generation X. Speaking of generations, I am told that our true crime podcast's first anniversary is upon us. Allow me to congratulate Jen and Cam for conquering the true crime podcasting community in only one year. And let me also offer my sincerest thanks for allowing me and OctoberPod to be a part of their Potter and family. Many happy returns. Jan and Cam, two of my favorite podcasters. You two, congrats on one year. I can't believe it. I look forward every Wednesday to hear what you've got in store for us next. I can't wait to see you at CrimeCon. Oh, by the way, it's Andy. It's me, Andy J, 68. Anyways, um, favorite episode. Oh my gosh, it's the Merle guy with the cereal. I literally have not eaten cereal since then. Um... I definitely just am so proud of you guys for just knocking it out of the ballpark week after week with the research and, you know, it's it's literally like listening, sitting at the bar, listening to two great friends of mine recording or talking about true crime. So congrats on your first year and I can't wait to see what's in store for the next year and I'll see you in May at CrimeCon. Love you guys. Hey, Jen and Cam, and Nico too. It's Jennifer from Haunted Happenstance. Congratulations on a whole year of scary good podcasting. And thank you for bringing us such amazing, horrifying, but also reflective true crime stories. You know, I tried really hard to think of my favorite anything. Episode, moment, joke, slip up, title. And I realized that's impossible. It's like asking... Who do you like better, Jen or Cam? You can't pick just one. It's the combination of both of you, and every detail of research, every snide comment about the bad guys and girls, each empathetic moment for the victims and their families and friends, that's what collectively makes each episode the best. But then I realized, fine, I could really do it if I had to. So I thought about it, and I figured it out. I know which one of you I'd pick. Just kidding. But I'm serious about all the amazing things for sure. I think the one story that sticks out in my mind for so many reasons was episode number 30, Ding Dong Dead, which detailed the premeditated murder of Peter Fabiano. I'm a huge Halloween fan, but after hearing this story, I might not ever answer the door for a trick-or-treater again. Even still, so much about the case makes me scratch my head. Was Joan really able to make another woman kill a man in cold blood for no other reason than to please her? Did Betty, Peter's wife, have anything to do with the hit? Did Betty or Goldine ever communicate with Joan again after the sentencing in prison time? The case also highlighted just how differently women were tried and sentenced as first-degree murderers when compared to their male counterparts. I'd never heard about this story before, and now, thanks to Jen and Cam, I can't stop thinking about it, and about 60 other true crimes. Needless to say, I definitely keep my doors locked, and I don't even go near any open windows. Love you both. This is from Brianna. I was scrolling through my Spotify one day and found podcasts I may like based on what I listen to, and there was our true crime podcast. I listened to the first episode, and as I listened, I laughed, and I ooed, and I aahed. Then the end came, and you all said, love ya, lock your doors, keep passing by those open windows. And that was it. I was hooked. Weirdly enough, I look forward to hearing that 
at the end of every episode. I love interacting with y'all on Twitter and Facebook. Love ya and keep doing what you do. That's so sweet. Thank you, Brianna. Hey, Cam and Jen. It's Chrissy with a K. Just want to let you guys know I love ya. I think your podcast is absolutely awesome. You two are so talented and gifted. And I really am am grateful that I found your guys' podcast and am able to look forward to every Wednesday and listening. And congratulations on your one year mark. That's definitely a, a milestone and so proud of you two. I know that this next year ahead, you guys are going to do even more amazing things and really looking forward to that. Always here to support you and really appreciate your guys' hard work and everything that you put into the into your shows. It, it, it does show. It really does. And I know that as time goes on and more and more people find the podcast and listen to it, that they're going to see just how talented you guys are and the time that you put in and um, the editing that you, you've had done that you, you have Nico do. It's, it's all amazing work and it just takes time. So I know that as you learn and you grow and you add more techniques and different ideas that uh, before you know it, at year two, you're going to look back on that and go, wow, we've, um, we've accomplished a lot and we haven't killed each other. So <laughs> yay for that. All right, I love you guys, and congratulations again on your one-year mark. Hello, it's Nico, the editor and composer for our True Crime podcast. Just wanted to take a moment to congratulate Jen and Cam for their one-year anniversary, and to personally thank them for their trust in me. Here's to many more. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam, how are you? You know what today is? I kind of do, yeah. What is it? It's our anniversary for one Happy year of podcasting. Can Happy you believe it? Yeah. No, I cannot believe it. July 11th was our... 7-11. A Slurpee and was our Trump, Trump Time date. podcast. Yeah, we've come a long way since then. Yes, we have. We have. Thanks to Nico. Thanks, Nico. Thanks to October Pod. Thanks, October Pod. Ed- Eduardo. Eduardo. So, uh, yeah, lots of tears, lots of laughter. Lots of tears. Lots of writing. Lots of tears. Lots of editing. Some arguments. Lots of... Computer crashes. Oh, tons of computer crashes. Mm-hmm. Lots of yep. tears. Yep. But anyway, we want to thank you so much for listening to us. It's it's all because of been you a pleasure. guys. It has been a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for sticking with us through thick and thin and crappy and mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. as crappy. Mm-hmm. We appreciate it. We really do. I wouldn't say we're not crappy. I'd just say we're less crappy. We are who we are. It is true. You know, we're not bad for an indie podcast. We're not bad right? for an indie podcast. <laughs> oh, people. Whatever. And their hate for indies. It just it bugs me. It bugs Whatever. me. Whatever. I, if I had a million dollars, hey, if I could afford it, we would not be doing this. We would hire people to do it. Exactly. As we laid on a beach in our mansion by the pool. Okay. A beach in the mansion by the pool? Yeah. I have a pool in my beach house, which is a mansion. Okay. Why go in the water when you can go in the pool? With all the critters. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, it's not as safe. And plus, with all the flesh-eating bacteria lately? Mm, that's only in Florida. So So far. Don't go to Florida and don't go to... Well, now supposedly there's some kind of weird bacteria that's growing in people's swimming pools. So what you got for us today? Well, since it's our anniversary, our... This kind of revolves around... This happened on someone's anniversary. Okay. I got you. Let's put it this way, if that sounds correct. But you know what? Just listen to it and you'll, you'll know. I'll put my slippers on. It's a long one. Okay. And it goes into detail. Mm-hmm. And so... So fasten your seatbelt. Put your slippers your on. Belt. Get a drink. Get a drink. December 25th, 1951 was a double celebration for Harry and Harriet Moore of Mims, Florida. Not only was it Christmas... This year, the couple were celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary. In those 25 years, the Moors had raised two daughters, taught countless children in segregated schools within the Brevard County, Florida, and founded the Brevard County chapter of the NAACP, just to name a few accomplishments. It had become a tradition for the couple to cut their anniversary cake just as they had on their wedding day, arm in arm and hand in hand. As they sliced their cake that evening, They had no idea they would become the first assassinations of the civil rights movement. Terrible. Soon after the happy couple retired for the evening, 
Their house exploded into shambles. Someone had planted a bomb made from dynamite under their floorboards of their bed. Harry died on the ambulance ride to a black hospital in Sanford, Florida, which was about 30 miles away. Now, there were closer hospitals, but, but he couldn't go. That they so weren't. Sad. They were segregated hospitals. This was the closest black hospital. I can't either. This story infuriates me. The whole thing infuriates me. You have no idea. I kept going to my husband. I kept going, can you believe this? And he's like, it's shocking. And it wasn't that long ago. Mm -mm. Nine days later, on January 3rd, 1952, at the same hospital, Harriet succumbed to her injuries and passed away. Harry Tyson Moore was born on November 18th, 1905 in Houston, Florida, an only child of Johnny and Rosa Moore. When Harry was nine years old, his father died. And although his mother tried incredibly hard to support herself and Harry, it just proved to be too difficult. Mm -hmm. She was working the store that his father had owned, and she was working in the cotton fields, and she just couldn't make enough money to survive, let alone raise a child. 1915, Rosa sent Harry to live with his three aunts in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, these aunts were very educated. Two were teachers, and one was a nurse. And they loved Harry. They took him in like he was their own child. They nurtured him and they reinforced his love of learning and they did everything they could. Three women, three, three women, educated three women educated with a little women. boy. Oh boy. Right. Harry thrived not only because of his doting aunts and that he loved education and everything like that, but Jacksonville at the time was this large community of African Americans. People now call Jacksonville at that time the Harlem of the South was kind of a mecca for African-American culture and heritage. So it provided some good opportunities for people. For Right. They had right. African-American-owned businesses. They had African-American-owned theaters and such. You know, they mm -hmm. had this own community, like Harlem did during the 1920s, mm -hmm. right? Well, this is also the start with the Great Migration or the Great Northward Migration. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm. Well, maybe, but I probably didn't pay attention in school, so I'm going to say no. Well, as you remember, after the Civil War, the Jim Crow laws were stated where the men were pretty much, black men were either sharecroppers or they had to work in the fields, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff that they mm -hmm. couldn't hold, big jobs. World War I started in Europe in 1914, which the industrialized urban areas in Northwest and Midwest areas were facing a shortage of industrial workers because most of their workers were European immigrants. Mm -hmm. Well, since the war... The immigrants weren't really coming over as often as they were. They were fighting in the war, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. With war production kicking into high gear, recruiters from the North came down to the South and enticed the African Americans to come up North to work for them. Because in the North, a factory worker made three times as much as a land worker in the South. And this also started a new era of political activism among the African-American communities. After being in Jacksonville for four years, Harry moved back home to continue his schooling. At 19, Harry graduated from Florida Memorial College with a normal degree. I'm assuming because it's his age of 19 that it wasn't a full four-year college. Like an associate's degree? Yes. Okay. It was like a two-year degree. With this normal degree, it allowed him to teach. So he took a teaching job, teaching fourth graders in the only black elementary school in Cocoa, Florida. During his first year teaching at the school, he met and fell in love with another teacher at the school. This was Harriet Sims. Aww. She was actually an older woman, three years older than him. Ooh, you go, boy. And they married one year later on Christmas Day. Aww. Now, it's been said that teaching at this school is where he learned firsthand that separate but equal was not a reality for black students. He worked against significant disadvantages, including poor facilities and limited financial resources. They taught from tattered books handed down from the white schools. One of Harriet's students later spoke of how Harriet taught from books with their own personal libraries. And I just thought, I'm going to read the whole quote. It's pretty cool. Quote, Mrs. Moore did not complain or express outrage at having to teach us from old tattered textbooks passed down to us from the white school. What she did do was teach us primarily from the few boxes of her own private books, which she kept hidden under her desk. Her books were about African-American people who had made important contributions to the world. 
people like W.E.B. Dubois and Mary McLeod Bethune. Mrs. Moore taught us about the freedom fighters Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. She read us stories by Zora Neale Hurston and poems by Langston Hughes, which later Langston Hughes wrote a poem about Harry T. Moore. She shared her Ebony Magazine articles about Black history. She didn't have to tell us not to tell anyone about these books. We knew they were dangerous when she appointed one of us to be a lookout person at the window. So if the superintendent of schools came in on one of his unannounced inspections, he wouldn't catch us using them. These books, their physical existence, and the stories they told taught me about unspoken truths, secrets, and lies. Amazing, isn't it? Very. To keep that, mm, 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 hate it. On March 28th, their first daughter was born. And after six months, after staying home six months with the child, she began teaching at the men's colored school. Two years later, their baby daughter, Juanita Evangeline, was born. Harry started to develop a passion for activism. In 1934, Harry and Harriet started the Brevard County chapter of the NAACP. He used this platform to challenge inequality, not only locally, but throughout the state of Florida. Along with the all-black Florida State Teachers Association and backed by the NAACP attorney, our good friend, Thurgood Marshall, oh. in New York, Harry filed the first lawsuit in the Deep South to equalize black and white teachers' salaries. And this was in 1934. You don't know the difference in pay, do you? I'm just curious. No, but I'm sure it was Tremendous. a lot. Although they lost the case in court, it paved the way to equalize salaries 10 years later. He was the mm. first person to do that. In 1944, our friend Thurgood Marshall won the landmark Smith versus Allwright case, in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled the all-white Democratic Party primary was unconstitutional. Harry Moore immediately organized the Progressive Voters League, and in the next six years, over one 116,000 black voters were registered in the Florida Democratic Party. The slogan was, a voteless citizen is a voiceless citizen. He said for years to like travel by bike over like muddy roads and just going way back in the country just to get people to sign up to him. vote. Amazing. With all this political activism, Harry started to become well-known amongst the racist locals and politicians. In 1947, he and Harriet were fired from their teaching jobs. That's terrible. Harry basically knew that he would never get another teaching job, so he became a full-time paid organizer for the Florida NAACP. And this man was a letter writer. He wrote senators and governors. Good. They have some of his letters online, and he's very eloquent. Mm -hmm. He's amazing. He's educated. Very educated. I mean, hmm. darn him for wanting equal rights. I know. So with this, Harry moved on to an even more dangerous area. Lynching was still alive and well in Florida. The vigilantes often took the law into their own hands, even in a few cases where the legal system ruled in favor of black people. Harry quickly threw himself into these cases, taking sworn affidavits from victims' families and launching his own investigations. Harry investigated every single lynching in Florida. Ugh. I'm sure that caused quite the ripple. No, here's a little. With the, you know. 1944, let's talk about the Klan for a little bit. Klan started, yeah, very late in the 1800s, and then about two years later it dissolved. And it then really dissolve, it though. really came back into play in 1915. It didn't really dissolve, though, you know that, right? It didn't, no. Yeah. But the actual organization dissolved. Or stopped. Came back in 1915, and within 10 years, they had over 3 million people. But then, during, like, 1928, numbers started to dwindle. And during the Depression, it went even further. But they were still alive and kicking. Backwoods. 1944, the National Klan organization went bankrupt due to the IRS filing a lien for nearly $700,000 and then paid taxes, penalties, and interests going back from the 1920s. I can't believe they even had financial records. Mm -hmm. So they dissolved it once again. 
but local chapters were allowed to continue on in what they called an informal, unincorporated alliance. With the splintering of the clan came uh, new, extremely violent organizations, and they started springing up across the South. And in Florida, in 1944, basically the strongest state in the nation that had the most Klan members was Florida. Really? The state of Florida. Mm-hmm. Had over 30,000 people. Hmm. See, so yeah, I would have went like Mississippi or... Georgia. No, mm-hmm. it was Florida. So in Florida, a plumbing contractor by the name of Bill Hendricks chartered the Southern Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Chartered them, meaning he established them? He established, okay. right. He founded the Southern Knights of the Ku Klux Klan and called himself the... Grand Wizard. The head of the organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So this chapter yes. grew very, very quickly, and particularly in the Orange County region where Harry T. Moore mm. was living. And it did so because prominent lawmen, businessmen, and elected officials joined all the white the folks. chapter. Yep. So this is where it all starts. Mm. So Harry is investigating all the lynchings that are in the state of Florida. In 1949, four young black men were accused of raping a 17-year-old white girl. Harry T. Moore would throw himself into the investigation, which would eventually make him a target for the Ku Klux Klan. Norma and Willie Pageant were a young, white, married couple living in Lake County, Florida. Both were from very poor farming families, and they had met when he was 21 and she was 16 years old. They eloped and got married, and they soon realized that that wasn't really a match made in heaven. (laughs) It's been said that Willie had hit Norma. Oh. And when Norma's father found out, she told Willie that next time it happens, I'm going to hit you. You're going to find yourself in real trouble, Willie, is basically what happened. Within a year of the marriage, Norma moved back home, and they separated for a little while. Well, Willie still wanted Norma back into his life, so he invited her one night to a square dance. So after the dance, the two get in Willie's car, and they go out looking for some food. They were hungry. Oh. Willie's car breaks down, and then after that, all the details get a little bit murky. Uh Uh-huh. He didn't run out of gas, did he? Car broke down. Mm -mm. No, that's the old, you know. Yeah. Are these people white or black? These people are white. Okay. The white, Norma and... Yeah, that's what yeah, I was thinking. Norma and Willa are white, the white married couple. Yep. Yeah. Early the next morning, on the 16th, a man named Lawrence Bertoff was working at his parents' cafe, which was on, along the same road that Willie and Norma had been on. He looks out the window thinking he sees a delivery truck. But what he sees is a woman. Well, and we find out it's Norma. Mm-hmm. So he goes out. Because a nicely dressed blonde woman in the middle of the country, mm-hmm. he, was, he came out and he asked her if she was okay. And she said she was. And he asked if she was waiting for someone and said, nope, not waiting for anyone. And she was by herself? She was by herself. Lawrence said the woman was calm and didn't appear to be in any distress. He asked her if she wanted a cup of coffee. She said yes. So she went in to the cafe and they started to talk. She told him that she and her husband, Willie, were out on the road and their car broke down. Willie had gotten out of the car and was trying to fix the car to make it start to work when four black men came by and offered to help fix the car. An argument pursued and the men knocked Willie out and took Norma. Lawrence asked if the men had hurt her and she said no. Is Lawrence white or black? White. Okay. Okay. He then asked her if she recognized the men. Did she know any of the men that had did this? And she said, no, not at all. And it was too dark to even see. Then Norma asked Lawrence if she could take her where she thought her husband had been, and he did so. They pulled up to the spot, and within five minutes, here comes Willie in the car. And Norma gets out. He hugs Norma, thanks Lawrence, and they're on their way. Norma and Willie headed back to Groveland, which is where they're from, and immediately spoke with the Lake County Sheriff's deputy, James Yates. They told Yates the same story that Norma told Lawrence, except they added that these four black men attacked Norma and raped her. 
So she told the police officer that, but didn't tell the gentleman that was at the cafe. She told Lawrence they didn't hurt her at all. And he said that she didn't have any bruises on her. She was dressed neatly. Why would she lie? Why would they lie? Mm -hmm. Well, somebody's lying. So then Yates took Norma to tell her story to Sheriff Willis McCall. He's a fucking asshole, too, oh, right? Oh, okay. you have no idea. Back in the 40s and 50s, Willis McCall was the most powerful elected official in the county. That just sounds like a jerk name. Mm -hmm. Lake County was the citrus capital of the world, and that was their main economy. That's what brought all the money in. And the town relied heavily on the African Americans for cheap labor. So Willis took it on his own main objective to keep the African Americans in the field. He thought they should either be at work in the fields or coming home from work in the fields. He sounds like a good guy. Willis McCall had a reputation for knowing how to keep the blacks in line, mm -hmm. and that was a quote. Willis was also known for beating blacks and entering homes without jurisdiction mm. or without justification. One thing I saw said that he came into somebody's house, beat the man in front of his wife and child, knocked him out, threw him over his shoulder, took him to jail, so he would be ready to go into the fields the next day. So Sheriff McCall asked Norman and Willie if they could identify the four men. Both said that they couldn't. They didn't know who they were, and they didn't get a good look at them. Because it never happened. But the sheriff's department had ideas on who it mm -hmm. who I it bet they did. Be. I bet they had a list. Their suspicions fell on two black men, Samuel Shepard and Walter Irvin. Now, these 22 year old men had been lifelong friends and both served in World War II. Both were very proud of their service and would wear their uniforms around town, which would make a lot of the white men very angry. Jealous. Well, it was a big deal to serve in World War II. I know, and, and they was, should be happy. They should be happy because they sacrificed. Yes, I know. But it also bothered them that they wouldn't work in the orange groves. Well, they served their country. They served their country, but they didn't go back to the work in the orange groves. Sam Shepard's family were actually landowners, and they had their own farm, mm -hmm. which was very unusual for the South. But Walter decided he wanted to do something different besides mm -hmm. picking I oranges. Them. I don't agree orders, but they just didn't go back to the fields. So that made the people in the uh, sheriff's office very mad. So Deputy Yates went to talk to Samuel Shepard. Samuel said he had been out with Walter that night. And so the deputies took him to Walter's house. Mm -hmm. And both men said that they had never even saw Norma and Willie that night. But the deputies wanted confessions. Mm -hmm. So they arrested Samuel and Walter and put them in the car. On the way to the station, however, the deputies pull the car over and they take the men out of the car. And they proceeded to beat Samuel and Walter for about 20 minutes trying to get them to confess. They would beat them over the head with the blackjacks and the billy clubs. They're like, you tell us, you took that girl. You know you took that girl. And they're like, no, sir, I didn't. No, sir, I didn't. They'd push him down and beat him, and then they'd pull him back up to stand up, and then they'd beat him down again. But Samuel and Walter never did confess. With the two suspects in custody, the sheriff was still on the lookout for two more men. Mm -hmm. So on July 15th, a little backtrack here, Ernest Thomas, who was 26, he was from Groveland, and he was in a town called Bronson, I believe. And he was working, and he was speaking to a friend named Charles Greenlee. Charles Greenlee was 16 years old, just gotten a girl pregnant, just got married. Mm. He was looking for money. And Ernest Thomas said, you need to come with me to Groveland. They've got tons of jobs. We can get you to work. There'll be a better and you life can get, for you. Yes, yeah. better life. So they traveled Bronson to Groveland. They called it the Groves. When they got to the train station, Charles felt he was just kind of dirty and didn't feel like it was appropriate to meet Ernest's mother. Mm -hmm. So he said, you know, just I'm going to stay here at the station. You know, I will get cleaned up and I'll meet her tomorrow. Right. And Ernest Thomas said, OK. Jokingly, Charles said, oh, I probably need a gun. So Ernest Thomas hands him over the gun. Mm -hmm. Right. The 16 mm -hmm. year old kid's like, oh, OK. So he takes it, doesn't know what else to do. During the night. Security guards found Charles, and they also saw that he had a gun. They were going to let him go because they said he seemed like a nice kid, but they needed the sheriff's department to come get him Ugh. just to make sure he wasn't wanted for any crimes. 
So about three o'clock in the morning, the sheriff's department comes to get him. And they lock him in a cell. And while he was locked away that morning, that's when Willie and Norma had come in, saying that Mm -hmm. they had been attacked and raped. Deputy Yates had Norma and Willie come into the cell and see if Charles was one of the men. Willie said, no, that's not him. Norma said, "Uh, he kind of looks like him. He looks like one of them. And then Willie again says, no, that's not one of them. So the deputies start talking to Charles, and they found out that he came to Groveland with Ernest Thomas. Now, I guess Ernest had caused trouble in the past, at least according to Sheriff McCall. Mm -hmm. So they figured that Ernest must have been a part of this group, and Charles was just guilty by association. It's frustrating, isn't it? Well, I just know how this is going to end, and it's not going to be good. So Sheriff McCall took the three men, Samuel, Walter, and Charles, to the county courthouse, which was in Tavares, Florida. McCall desperately needed confessions from the men, so he sent Deputy Yates and Deputy Campbell, and they took each of the men separately into the basement where they were beaten. The deputies would punch and kick and tell them they would keep beating them until they confessed. They took the girl. But one of the worst things they did, and this is so awful, they were in handcuffs. They put the handcuffs over a water pipe overhead. And so they were just kind of dangling with their feet, barely touching the ground. And then they took soda bottles and broke them up on the floor. And so every time that they would, would kick, step down. Oh. every time they would punch them or kick them, their feet would drag across the floor and get cut by the glass. It was awful. This went on for hours. They'd beat one guy and then take him upstairs, let the other two see how bloodied and messed up he was, wait 10 minutes, and then grab another guy. <sighs> You know, I think that they had to get something sexual out of that. I swear to God. I don't, there's so much hatred in there. Do, do you know what I mean, though? How can you hate anything that much? I mean, for and no it's not reason. a fair fight. For like, no reason. For They have extra melatonin in their skin. I don't get it. Why were they so... Uh, bullies. Eventually, Samuel and Charles confessed because they actually thought that they were going to be killed, that these men were going to kill them. And remember, Charles was only 16 years old. Mm-hmm. Walter never confessed. Mm-mm. Well, I would be thinking you're going to die either way. I right. sure wouldn't confess. Why confess to something you didn't do? So news of the arrest of these men that raped the white women spread quickly through the area. Soon, upwards of 300 people stormed the courthouse. And not for the gentlemen's sake. No, right? they wanted to take revenge. They wanted to mm-hmm. lynch. Even though they wanted to get them in and lynch said that them. that was not them. Okay. Supposedly, McCall had heard this little rumbling, so he had Samuel and Charles, the two that confessed, taken to, it's called Rayford Prison, which is about two hours away for safety. Walter was still in prison at the courthouse. He needed that confession. Once the deputies had taken the two men, Sheriff McCall stood in front of this angry mob and told them that, you know what? Hey, listen, these men, they're going to get what's coming to them. You hired me to do this. You elected me to do this. We're going to do this the right way, by the law. I'm not going to let you lynch them, and they're not even here. So, you know, I'm just going to uphold the law. That's what I'm going to do. Right. Mob didn't leave. So, after a while, McCall sent for Willie Paget and Norma's father to come in and say, you know, go down and you tell me if those men are here. So, remember, Walter's still in the basement. Willie Paget and Mr. Tyson go downstairs to the cells, come back, and they said, nope, the men responsible aren't being held here. And only then did the mob leave. Once word got out that Sheriff McCall calmed this huge, angry mob just by speaking with them, this case spread to, like, northern newspapers everywhere. Northern newspapers started to pick up the story, and McCall became a star of the Mm -hmm. press, right? Papers reported that he was noble and courageous, And they praised him for calming down this lynching mob. But not only was he calming them down, he was saying, oh, they're going to get the chair. We're going to, you know. The next morning, hundreds gathered in Groveland. Many were Klan members from in and around Lake County. Now, McCall knew this was going to happen because Mm -hmm. he knew a lot of members of the Klan. He put his little feelers out there to to get them to come, too. I guarantee it. He One, wanted this. He wanted the show. Well, the head of the local clan chapter in the Groveland, Grand Dragon. Mm-hmm. 
This was just the local chapter. The Grand this, Iguana. Mm -hmm. This was just the head of the chapter, not the oh. organization. He was actually downstairs in the basement while they were beating. Oh, I'm sure he was. Yeah, so it seems that Sheriff McCall... Donned a little white robe once in a while, too? Maybe. Yes, of course he maybe. did. Maybe. Yeah. How do you think he got elected? Duh. And it said that McCall told the men, just do what you need to do and then go home. Do what you need to do. I'm going to look the other way. Exactly. I'm going to give you 10 minutes, then go home. What a guy. As soon as the African-Americans' homes and crops were set on fire and burned to the ground. Wait, when? When? This was that day. After McCall gave them the go-ahead, the crowd started burning down. Oh, African do what you American. need to do, and that's what they did? They started burning down the African-Americans' houses, the crops. African-Americans were forced out, and actually, almost the entire population of African-Americans in that town left that night. I wouldn't want to live there anyway. All while Sheriff McCall stood there and watched. Mm -hmm. Come morning, Monday morning, when the oranges need to be picked. Oh, yeah. Do they remember that? <laughs> the citrus barons realized that, huh... Huh. We kind of chased our labor force away. Darn it. Damn. So they called for Sheriff McCall to assure the their labor that it was safe to come back. Now, would you come to back? To work in the field. Would you come back? Hell no. I know. I'm sure they needed the money, but I sure, uh-uh. No. I, I, That's I, there's a trap. different. Mm -hmm. McCall finally called in the National Guard. Oh. The first National Guard was just a small one that didn't have any artillery, and they didn't really have any luck trying to quell the mob but the big one from tampa area brought in their heavy artillery and mm. they were able to mm. quell it mm -hmm. they didn't punish any of the mob people but they just you stop it there boy so as i said before sheriff mccall loved to talk to the press and the press loved him so much that they the southern press mm -hmm. that they believed everything that mccall told them Sheriff McCall was telling the reporters that this case was as good as it gets. It's open and shut. That all men have confessed. All three of these guys have confessed. And all that was left was the burning, the execution. <clears throat> I mean, they printed it word for word. And in fact, one of the largest newspapers ran an editorial cartoon long before the trial date was even set, stating that the men were going to fry. Mm -mm. So these men were pretty much judged before trial started. They were judged for being black. That's it. By July 20th, the state attorney, Jesse Hunter, or Jess Hunter, J-E-S-S-E. -S -S -E, it, be, it could be uh, either. Yeah. Went before the grand jury. Norma Paget testified, and so did Sheriff McCall, who said that all three of the accused had confessed, which was a dirty lie, only lie. to confess. Walter did not. That day, the all-white male jury returned an indictment and a trial was set for August 29th. I didn't see that coming. Now, Sheriff McCall still needed that one man for the crime. And that one man he knew was Ernest Thomas. So he organized a posse oh, no. to find him. Ernest had fled the area when... Smart, smart Ernest. People started setting fire to things, right? Mm -hmm. And the people that were deputized, not only were they not fit for law enforcement... They were relatives of Norma and Willie, and it just wasn't very kosher. The manhunt lasted 10 days and covered about 200 miles. And at one point, the posse had over 1,000 men looking for Ernest Thomas. So 10 days after Norma's allegation of rape, the posse found Ernest in the woods resting beneath a tree. There was no attempt to arrest him. They just opened fire. Mm -hmm. And the posse filled Ernest Thomas' body with over 400 bullets. You're kidding. McCall told the newspapers that Ernest Thomas was armed with a loaded pistol. No, nope, he wasn't. don't think so. His finger was around the trigger and belligerent as the devil before his death. Belligerent as the devil is in quotes. His death certificate reads, justifiable homicide. And it took 400 bullets to take that man mm -hmm. down. When he was laying on the ground already. So Sheriff McCall brings Norma to look at Ernest's bullet-riddled body at the funeral home because he wants her to identify him as one of the men who attacked her. And she does. She identifies him. I don't know how she could with his body being filled with over 400 holes, including his face. I mean, he was... Yeah, yeah there would be nothing left. Yeah. So when she does identify him, Sheriff McCall 
gives her a bullet that was pulled out of Ernest's body for a keepsake. When Sheriff McCall comes back into Groveland, Dr. Beneveld tells him that he examined Norma and he couldn't conclusively tell one way or the other if Norma had been sexually assaulted. McCall tells him that, you know what, this case is open and shut and, you know what, you're not going to be needed to testify, so it's over. Of Thanks. course. Thanks for yeah. your service. Why, why would we want that? Don't let the door hit you. Why would we want that? This is where Harry Moore comes prevalent in the case. Mm-hmm. When Sheriff McCall started bragging about saving the three accused men from this angry lynch mob and bragging about he had gotten all three to confess, Harry Moore became suspicious of McCall, and he hired an NAACP attorney, William Fordham, to go talk to Samuel, Walter, and Charles. William Fordham got written affidavits from the men stating that they were badly beaten and forced to confess. Fordham then brought in someone for the medical field to document all the men's scars, bruises, cuts, broken teeth, lacerations, you name it, which was very smart, by the way. After Harry Moore saw the documents, he reported that these men had been tortured to the FBI, and the FBI started their own investigation. Harry Moore was quite vocal about this case, and not only did he speak about it to the people of Florida— He made it known to all the attorneys that were north at the NAACP National Headquarters in New York. A man viewed as one of the best lawyers in the country just happened to be ahead of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, our good friend Thurgood Marshall. Yay! He and his defense team spent most of his time fighting legal segregation and had little time for criminal cases, but he decided to take this one on. Thurgood Marshall called upon a black attorney in Orlando, Horace Hill, to start gathering depositions. He also sent Frank Williams, a black attorney from New York that worked with the NAACP, down to Orlando. But Franklin Williams needed a law license to practice in Florida, which he didn't have, so he couldn't be first counsel, I think is what they called. So they had to get another lawyer, basically, Mm -hmm. to set in. So they call upon all the other black attorneys in Florida, and none of them are competent enough, I guess, is mm-hmm. what to say, or experienced enough to take on a case like this. It was so huge mm-hmm. in the news. It was heavily publicized. And the capital case, they just didn't feel that any of the black lawyers were able to do it. So they turned to the white attorneys, which no one oh, yeah. wanted to do. They were saying, are you crazy? They'll come after me now. Black men against a white woman? No, it's not going to worry. No. But one man did, and his name was Alice Ackerman. And he knew it was going to totally mess up his practice. He'll never be able to practice again wow. if he wanted to. But he did his the right political thing. political career was shot, but he did it anyway. And they retained him on August 22nd, which was only a week before the trial started. Wow. So he had no time. To prepare, yeah. Like a week to prepare for this case. In fact, Alice Ackerman had only spoken to the three men like 30 minutes each. He actually asked the judge if they could delay the case just so he could prepare more. Mm -hmm. And they did for three days. Oh. But during those three days, there was a hurricane. Oh. All the power and everything was out, Mm. so nothing could be done. And, you know, you're going to be shocked, but he wasn't getting much info from the prosecution of this case. They weren't helping. They didn't have any discovery for him, which you know what discovery is. Mm -hmm. They probably provided them. They Mm -hmm. there was no known facts to give him, no information of the case, no evidence of the case was provided for Mr. Ackerman. Nothing. Wow. On September second was the trial date. And it was kind of well, not fun, but one of the articles I read said it was almost just like the scene out of To Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, I bet. Because the courtroom was packed. Mm -hmm. There's over 400 white people packed into the courthouse. 75 blacks were in the balcony. And there were reporters from national newspapers, from the north, from everywhere. And, of course, there was the 12 white men on the jury. Mm -hmm. Of course. They were all there to see Sheriff McCall make good on his promise. There would be four black men paying with their lives over the rape of a white woman. Over the alleged rape of yeah, a white exactly. woman. exactly. That didn't happen. The defense had Willie and Norma come to testify. Willie just did an okay job, but Norma put out all the stops. I mean, she testified like she was on a stage saying, you know, how she was raped at gunpoint by these four men. Uh, mm. 
Did they call Lawrence to the stand? Lawrence, the kid from the cafe? No, the prosecution Shocker, huh? put him on the list of maybe to be called. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. but not to be called. Maybe. and But it wouldn't have mattered anyway because no, it wouldn't have. the defense never got that list. So Deputy Yates then takes the stand as an expert witness. He introduced Walter's pants into evidence stating that there were semen stains on them, which were never tested, by the way. Also brought Walter Irvin's shoes, which he claimed were a perfect match to the castings on plaster molds that he had taken of shoe prints in the mud where Norma and Willie claimed that the rape and attack happened. Where was Willie during all of this when Norma was being attacked? He was knocked out cold. Oh. They fought him and they knocked him out. Oh, that's right. They and then she him. walked to that cafe. No, her story was then the blacks took her. Oh, they they were so nice. Then, as a courtesy, they right, dropped her they, off at the they, cafe. They abducted her. Oh, oh, okay. Raped her, then dropped her off. Right. Okay. The defense then called Samuel, Walter, and Charles to the stand. Charles was the only sympathetic one. The rest seemed very hardened and a little angry, nonchalant. Yeah, about mm -hmm. the whole deal. He came off just like he was, young and innocent. In fact, he'd never even been inside a courtroom before, mm -hmm. and it showed. He was just a nervous and scared kid that was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The only thing that Alex Ackerman had going for this case was that Charles was arrested at 310 the same night Norma claimed that she was being raped 16 miles away at 315. There was no way Charles could have been there. If Charles wasn't there, there wasn't a gun. And Norma just testified to being raped at gunpoint and even said the gun that had been entered into evidence was the gun that was used mm. Somebody's on her. Lying. Trial only lasted a day. The jury was sent out for deliberation and the judge calls Alex Ackerman to the bench and says, you know what? There's a door right behind me. <laughs> as so soon as the jury comes back with the verdict, you and your defense team Get out of here, and I will keep everybody in this courtroom for 30 minutes, and you get out of town as fast as you can. That is horrifying. So the jury comes back quickly, and it's guilty verdict. Now, Samuel and Walter are given the death penalty. They are going to go to the electric chair. But they found Charles, who was 16 years old. They took mercy on him because he was young, and they gave him life in prison. Oh, for not being there? Mm -hmm. Impossible for him to be there. That was nice of him. Now, see, if you were Norma and Willie, how could you live with yourself? Seriously. She was getting a lot of attention, Camille. It doesn't matter. Look, you ruined people. She was getting a lot of attention. This poor oh, this white woman. Whatever. I think after a while, she came to believe it herself. Gosh. It became so ingrained in her that she actually believed it. I mean, to this day, she's 80-something. Are they still alive? She is. Mm. She still maintains that she was raped by those men. She was not raped? As the black attorneys, Franklin Williams and Horace Hill, along with two black reporters, made their way out of town that night after the ruling, they noticed they were being followed. There was a car following them and accelerating and catching up with them, and they were on the back of the car, literally mm -hmm. on their tail. So Horace Hill hits the accelerator, and soon they see a man on the side of the road and he's waving a white handkerchief like he's in trouble and he's trying to wave him down. Nope. But Horace doesn't stop and it wasn't until they got out of Orange County that the car stopped following them. The newspaper reporters wrote about the case, Horace Hill, and it was well known that mm -hmm. this happened. Mm -hmm. Everybody in Lake County, Florida, denied it happened. Of course. They, yeah. You think they're going to admit that? They would mm -hmm. have killed them. From August 1949... The FBI had done their own investigation since Harry Moore had told them about it. And they agreed that Samuel, Walter, and Charles had been tortured and had their civil rights denied. And they also had a copy of Dr. Benvald's physical that he performed with Norma. Mm -hmm. And he stated they had found semen. no semen <laughs> inside of Norma whatsoever. But they weren't going to use him. But they felt that the deputies should be indicted on civil rights violations. The Department of Justice referred the case to a U.S. attorney in Tampa by the name of Herbert Phillips. Herbert was once quoted as saying that, quote, African Americans are ignorant and an inferior race. Unquote. And that's who they contacted. That's who they contacted. So Phillips took the case to the grand jury, but never called any witnesses from the FBI or the prisons or any place where this 
the men had been held. And so, not only were the deputies cleared of all charges, they were congratulated. I was going to say they got promoted. Not everyone praised McCall and his deputies. They had many critics. But no one was as loud as Harry Moore. Oh, Harry. Harry started protesting what had happened at every chance he could. He wrote letters and sent telegrams to the governor, state's attorney's office, to members of every level of the federal government, trying to make them aware of what happened to these poor men. Harry even began talking to all African Americans in the area, saying that if it could happen to these families, it could happen to your families. And Harry's criticism did not go unnoticed Mm -hmm. by Sheriff McCall. Mm -hmm. So the case was appealed to the National Supreme Court. This time, Thurgood Marshall himself was the leading defense attorney. Arguments started before the court on March 9, 1951. One month later, the Supreme Court overturned the conviction of Samuel and Walter. So the Supreme Court Justice Robert Jackson wrote that the jury had already been told that the men were guilty. The defendants were already judged as guilty, and the trial was only a legal gesture to register a verdict that was already dictated by the press and public opinion. That's why they overturned it. So the second trial was scheduled for November 7, 1951. The evening before the trial, November 6, 1951, Sheriff McCall makes the two-hour drive to Rayford Prison. The sheriff takes Samuel and Walter, makes them sit in the front seat of his car, and drives them back. After a bit, Sheriff McCall says, huh, I think there's something wrong with my tire. So he pulls the car over, gets out, looks at the tire, comes back in, and starts driving again. They go about two more miles, and the sheriff pulls over again. And Sheriff McCall tells Samuel and Walter to get out of the car and change the tire. A bit later, Sheriff McCall radios Deputy Yates and tells him to round up as many good people as he could and come out to where he is. Sheriff McCall states that Samuel and Walter had attacked him and tried to escape, so he had to shoot them to save his own life. You're kidding me. Mm-mm. Yates brings 20 of Sheriff McCall's friends out to the scene on this lonely, dark road. There they find Samuel Shepard had been shot right between the eyes and had died instantly. Walter Irvin was barely hanging on to life. He had been shot through the neck and chest and was bleeding heavily. McCall tells a story, and it's so over the top that most of the people don't believe him. One of the men that came that night to the scene was the state prosecuting attorney, Jesse Hunter. And when he came home, he actually called a friend of his and said, you know what? I don't believe Samuel and Walter tried to escape. No, of course not. He goes, I think McCall deliberately shot them. Walter Irvin was taken into emergency surgery that night, and he miraculously survived. Oh, good. Sheriff McCall ordered Detective Yates to keep everybody away from Walter. He turned away Alex Ackerman, his attorney. They even turned away his parents from seeing him. Yeah, they didn't want him to say anything. But the person who did get to go see him was the attorney, Jesse Hunter. He was allowed in. He was the one that put him in prison Mm -hmm. in the first place, Mm -hmm. right? It's said that Jesse leaned over and said, Walter, you're about to die. And there's nobody else in this room to hear it. But I need to know, did you rape that girl? And Walter looked at him and he said, no, sir, I did not. Good. He never confessed. Everybody came to Groveland, to this town, when this happened. Once they heard that McCall had shot these two and the two prisoners tried to escape, North came down, the governor sent an investigator, Third Marshal came, was there, everybody. Mm-hmm. Like, that was a huge it story. It just went, mm-hmm. the press went to town, literally, to Groveland. Everything was going fine, and then Walter told his version of events to reporters and Thur Good Marshal. And this is what his events said. I hope, he, I hope Marshall put him in the backseat of the car and took him home with him. It's the only way he's going to live. Walter said that the sheriff had pulled over, walked to the passenger side of the car, and told the men to get out and changed the tire. Samuel, who was by the door, stood up, and as soon as he did, Sheriff McCall shot him Mm. in the head. Samuel fell, and then McCall turned and shot Walter while he was still sitting in the car. McCall then shot Samuel again. McCall then reached into the car, grabbed Walter by his shirt, and drug him out of the car, and Walter falls to the ground. He was shot again. 
Walter then states that he remembers McCall radioing Yates, saying to come out there. And McCall tells Yates that, quote, they attacked me and I fixed them up good. Walter says that a short time later, he remembers Yates coming up to him with a flashlight shining in his face, and he tells McCall, he ain't dead yet, we better finish killing him. Yates then shoots Walter in the neck. Again? I'm surprised how he did make it. Walter lays so still that they would think that he is dead. And Sheriff McCall then reaches up to his own shirt and starts to rip it, while Deputy Yates had to make it look like they had tried to escape. So now the story that was a national sensation went international. Good. I mean, it was on the front page in France. Good. And even the Soviet ambassador started warning people, this is what civil rights in America is like. That's right. Mm -hmm. On November 9th, an inquest convened about the shooting. And it was led by a judge that was a close childhood friend of Sheriff McCall's. Mm. They're all on the pay there. Mm -hmm. but they... they he needs to go to another state to get even a somewhat fair trial. But not only that, the people that were there to hear all the evidence at this inquest, they were also the ones that were at the scene that Deputy Yates I know. had brought. That's what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Their, their whole town is, the whole state. They need to, mm -mm. Yep. And of course, they found Sheriff McCall not at fault. And in fact, he did shoot in self-defense. Mm -hmm. Soon the FBI held their own inquest. When their investigation started, they couldn't find all the bullets. But when they finally found the last bullet, it was in the ground right under where Walter was laying. And they concluded that the bullet only would have been there if somebody was standing over him mm -hmm. and shot down, mm -hmm. like Walter said mm -hmm. Yates did. They also said that what was very telling to them was that Walter Irvin consented to a polygraph test, while McCall and Yates adamantly refused. But in the end... The Department of Justice didn't think that just these facts were enough, and they didn't bring it to a grand jury. Mm -mm. What more do you need? So after this, McCall started being heavily criticized in the papers, especially up north, and even in the south, where they once totally mm -hmm. loved him and they took everything he said as the word of God. The northern states were calling him a cold-blooded killer, and even southern states started doubting him. But the person who criticized the loudest was Harry Moore. Harry started traveling the state again, started calling for the governor to indict Sheriff McCall for murder. Just firing him wasn't going to be enough. Harry then became the most visible vocal critic of Sheriff McCall in the entire state of Florida. He was relentless. Six weeks after the shooting is when Harry and Harriet were murdered by the bomb that was placed under their bedroom floor. The morning of the bombing, hundreds of people showed up in the rubble that was left behind of the house and FBI agents and the local deputies of the MIMS Florida Sheriff's Office went through the crowd and said, you know, who do you think would have done this? Who would? And everybody always said people of Groveland. So the initial FBI investigation, of course, focused on the Klan. They had two primary suspects. One was Earl J. Brooklyn and the other was Tillman H. Blevin. I'm going to go with Tillman. That name sounds terrible. Well, both men had been expelled from Klan Claverns, that's mm. the little groups, mm -hmm. in Georgia for, get this, being too violent. They were kicked out of the Klan because they were too violent. Back then, I didn't know that that was a thing. Mm -mm. An informant had told the FBI that both Brooklyn and Belvin had participated in beatings and bombings in the past. The informant also said that Brooklyn had shown Klan members a sketch of the floor plan of the Moore's home and was seeking others to join him in casing the place, mm -hmm. Moore's place. Months after the bombing, a witness identified Brooklyn and Belvin as being in a local store asking directions to the Moore's home. When interviewed by the FBI, Brooklyn gave conflicting accounts of his whereabouts on Christmas Day 1951, when compared to those accounts provided by interviews with the informants. Brooklyn could not account for the evening hours on Christmas night. Belvin... During the first week of January, someone asked Belvin if he had any more dynamite, and Belvin responded by saying, no, I used it all in the last job. Belvin was also known to wear a size 6 shoe, which seems awful. That's small, tiny. Unless there's some kind of different no. things back then. No. And size 6, 8 footprints were found at the scene of the explosion. Belvin 
also paid off the balance of his mortgage, which was approximately $2,500. And he had just bought the house in 1948, but he paid it off four days before the bombing happened. where did he get that money from, I wonder? Mm -hmm. Brooklyn and Belvin both died while the FBI's initial investigation was being conducted. How'd they die? Belvin died of natural causes on August 1952, and Brooklyn died of natural causes on Christmas Day, 1951, one year after the day of the bombing. Another member they investigated was Joseph Cox. He was also a member of the Ku Klux Klan, and Cox was known to be a longtime member, and FBI questioned him, hoping he would provide further information about Brooklyn and Belvin. He was first interviewed on March 10, 1952, and denied any knowledge of the bombing, but he did provide background information on Brooklyn and Belvin. When they interviewed Cox the second time, he again denied any knowledge of the bombing. Cox did, however, inquire several times during the interview whether the FBI's evidence would hold up in court. Will this hold up in court? Do you have evidence that will hold up in court? The next day, Cox killed himself with a shotgun he borrowed from a friend. Cox's suicide was investigated by the Winter Garden Police, who advised the FBI that Cox did not leave a suicide note. Because it wasn't suicide the FBI concluded that Klan members and some law enforcement officers were behind the murders of Harry and Henriette Moore, but no charges were brought and they never implicated Sheriff McCall by name. So after the assassination of the Moores, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP used their deaths to rally support and raise funds for Walter Irvin's defense for the new trial that was Mm -hmm. coming up on February 11th. Before the trial went into full swing, Jesse Hunter sent Thurgood Marshall a note stating that if Walter Irvin would plead guilty, that the prosecution would give him a life sentence and take the death sentence off the table. That's so nice. So after talking with his family, Walter took the deal. Walter then asked Thurgood Marshall what he had to do to take this deal. And Marshall told him that all he had to do was when the judge asks how he pleads, he just says guilty. Walter then asked, You know, does that mean that I actually raped Norma? To which Marshall replied, well, technically it is an admission of guilt. And after hearing that, Walter refused to do it. He Mm -hmm. wasn't going to lie. He's innocent. He's innocent. And he was not. He never confessed. Never confessed to this. So later, Thurgood Marshall would say that at that moment, this is when he knew that he was representing an innocent man. Just like the trial before, Walter was sentenced to death, and Thurgood Marshall filed for an appeal, but the motion for a new trial was dismissed. Then, the petition to the Supreme Court for a new trial was denied in 1954. On November 1st, 1954, Governor Charlie Johns signed Walter's death warrant, and within the following week, Walter would be put to death. Thurgood Marshall knew that the governor was a segregationalist, And he knew that Johns wanted to see Walter die in the electric chair. He also knew that Governor Johns had just lost his seat as governor in the prior election. So Thurgood Marshall sent a petition for a stay of execution on November 6th. And that was accepted because he thought Johns wanted him dead. Maybe the new governor might not. So when the new governor, Larry or Leroy Collins, came into office, he started receiving thousands and thousands of letters, all stating, all pleading with him to stay the execution, just to commute Walter's sentence. There was so much pressure on him, and these were just normal, everyday folks saying, you know, I can't believe he had such a bad trial, everything was awful, this is un-American, what am I going to tell my children, you know, all this kind of stuff. And there was so much pressure on him that He hired a close friend who was also a lawyer. His name was Bill Harris, and he asked him to look over the case and see what he thought. Well, Bill Harris comes back and he says, oh, this case, there's so many problems. It's it's not right. Reports everything that was wrong. States how there was no medical testimonies, no actual evidence, all sorts of things. And Bill Harris even said that he doubted Sheriff McCall's version of the events that happened the night of the shooting, Mm -hmm. which is he's a smart man because uh, everybody doubts those events. On December 6th of 1955, Collins led the parole board to commute Walter's death sentence. 
later stating that this was, quote, a bad case, which was badly handled, badly tried, and on this bad performance, I was asked to take a man's life. My conscience will not let me do this, end Good. quote. He was commuted to a life sentence. And he pretty much thought he would just die in jail. But he was surprised in 1968 when he was let out of prison on parole. He then moved to Miami and worked in construction. So about two years later, Walter went back to Lake County to attend a funeral of the family member. Mm -mm. Would you even go back? No. Never. One night while he was there, he joined the family for some drinks. When they returned home later in the morning, they left Walter sleeping in the car. Mm -mm. A few hours later, they came back to check on him, and Walter had passed away. Of natural causes? As far as I know, natural causes. Okay. They said that when he got out of prison, he was just a shell of the man. Yeah, like, he had lost most of his teeth, that he was only 40, but he looked like he was 85, Oof. and prison was very hard on him. Yeah. Charles Greenlee was paroled after serving 11 years. He was 28 years old at the time he was released. The prison gave him a bus ticket to his hometown, which I believe was Bronson, Florida. And he never told his family. It was a surprise. And he stood on the porch by the screen door. And his sister kind of stood there and made the claim, hey, wow, that stranger, he kind of looks like Charles. Well, lo and behold, it really that, was Charles. That would be a shock. The family was happy. They welcomed Charles back with open arms and reunited for basically three hours until it started getting dark. And Charles is like, yeah, I'm going to take a bus and go to Tennessee and get out of him. Exactly what I do. They said he was just scared that the prison officials would come back to mm -hmm. him and say, you know what? We made a mistake. You're going back to prison. Mm -hmm. So he moved to Tennessee. He lived with his brother for a while, opened up a heating and cooling repair type mm -hmm. business, remarried lived out his life, and I believe he's still alive. Aww. Sheriff McCall Ugh. was reelected seven more times. Even oh. though the press started to go doubt everything he said, mm -hmm. they still needed a man like McCall, I guess. I don't know. Nobody needs a man like McCall. No. Oh, gosh. Ooh. Ooh. So in 1972, McCall beat a man named Tommy Vickers. Now, Tommy had an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. And he was also black, but he was brought in on a minor traffic violation. Vickers died because of this beating at the end of April. By June, Sheriff McCall was indicted, and the governor immediately suspended him of his sheriff's badge. But of course, McCall was acquitted by an all-white jury. Finally, in November of 72, McCall went up again for election for his eighth term, and he lost. Thank God. With that, he retired. And Willis McCall actually was a self-made man. He grew up very, very poor. His dad was a dirt farmer, whatever that is. <laughs> and he started his own dairy company, or his dairy farm, which was huge. And by the age of 30, he sold it and came into wow. money. And then he became a sheriff. Willis McCall died in 1994 at the age of 84 years old. Mm -hmm. I can't so really say him. his life out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure a lot of people were pretty happy to read that obituary. So, of course, Thurgood Marshall went on to become the first African-American Supreme Court justice. He was sworn in on 1967, but he said his greatest achievement of his career was his victory in the landmark 1954 Supreme Court case of Brown versus the Board of Education in Topeka, which, of course, stopped the illegal act of segregating blacks and whites from school. And, of course, the Brown versus the Board of Education provided the legal foundation and was the inspiration of pretty much the civil rights movement. It's pretty much what started the civil mm -hmm. rights movement mm -hmm. as we know it. It's been slow, but it's getting there. So in the case of the Moore's assassination, there have been five criminal investigations, right? We talked about the first one. The second one was in 1978 by the Brevard County Sheriff Roland Zimmerman. He reopened the case after attending memorial service for Harry Moore. He assigned a detective from the Brevard County Sheriff's Office to retrace the steps of the FBI's investigation. Well, during this investigation, this detective kept getting phone calls from a man named Edward L. Spivey. Mm. He called many times complaining about the reopening of this case, citing that it was just a waste of taxpayers' money. 
I bet you he donned one of those white hoods, didn't he? I think you're right. So through conversations with Spivey, found out that he was a, or he had been a high-ranking official or a high-ranking member of the Klan in Central Florida at the time. So Spivey decided he wanted to meet with the detective, and they met probably about 10 times. And during one of these meetings, Spivey revealed that his close friend, Joseph Cox, remember Joseph Mm -hmm, Cox, mm -hmm. committed suicide, was responsible for detonating the dynamite under the Moore's house. Spivey insisted that Cox's actions were not sanctioned by the Klan, and he then told the detectives, I'm dying of cancer. So all his confessions considered deathbed confessions. Mm -hmm. So Spivey explained that Cox came to his house the day after Cox had the second interview with the FBI, and he told Spivey that, boy, I've done something wrong. And according to Spivey, Cox told him that the Klan had paid him $5,000 to kill Harry Moore. Cox claimed to have used the money to pay off his mortgage and was reportedly afraid that the FBI would find out about this. When they investigated it, they couldn't find any payment that his mortgage was paid off or anything at that time. That wouldn't be hard to find. Exactly. So Spivey also mentioned that Cox actually happened to borrow his shotgun and then went home. So that was Spivey's shotgun was what was used to kill. Do you think he really killed himself? Or Spivey killed him. Yes, I just, I don't know about that. Okay. So Spivey indicted all personal involvement in the shooting of course he did. and the bombing, mm-hmm. but provided such detailed account of the bombing that uh, the sheriff's office believed that Spivey must have been present when Cox planted the bomb. The state attorney's office was preparing to take the case against Spivey to the grand jury. They were going to indict him for it. But of course, the state attorney was up for re-election and lost. Good. So... Spivey was never prosecuted, and the case closed, and then Spivey died in 1980 of cancer. Another incident happened, or another investigation happened in 1991. Nothing came of the investigation, from what I can tell, because all the pertinent information had been X'd out, so it's like XX came to XXX (laughs) and told them that XXXXX was there at the site of the bombing, but XXXXX <laughs> yeah. denies that XX, so I couldn't figure it out what it was going to say. So all we know is nothing came about. 2004, Attorney General Charlie Christ, or Christ announced that his office was reopening the investigation to review the history of the case and to seek new witnesses for information that could lead to identifying those individuals responsible for the bombings. They interviewed over 100 people and conducted a complete excavation of the site of Moore's home. They re-interviewed many people that originally was interviewed by the FBI, as well as neighbors of the Moors that the FBI didn't get to. The only thing that they came up with, the Attorney General's investigation, was extensive and concluded that Brooklyn, Belvin, Cox, and Spivey were the ones likely responsible for the bombing. It was also brought up again in 2008, where, again, the FBI opened it up and they reviewed the prior four investigations and identified 10 former members of the Central Florida Klan who may have had pertinent information about the bombings. But when they went to speak with them, they found out eight were dead, and two they couldn't locate, but they believe are dead also. So anyway, it's those four that they completely, 100% believe, were responsible, but they could never be brought to justice Mm -hmm. because they were dead. So we will never know for sure. Mm Mm-hmm. But definitely the KKK did that. Exactly. But as for the Groveland Four, in 2017, the state of Florida posthumously commuted the sentence and pardoned the Groveland Four. Unfortunately, only one was alive to see it Hmm. at the time, and that was Charles Greenlee. Norma still claims that she was raped by the four, Mm -hmm. but at this point, I don't think she can go back. Yeah, she can't. There'd be a mob waiting for her to take care of her. And also in the documentary that I watched, I believe it was on PBS, Walter had confessed to a sister that he and Samuel did stop on the road to help Willie and Norma with the car Mm -hmm. because one of them was a mechanic. After they got the car working, Norma offered them a drink of the liquor that they had had. And Willie went off on them and started hitting them. And Mm -hmm. that's all we know. So my guess is... How could you live with yourself, though? I don't know. One person, well, two people, well, the whole town really ruined those boys' lives. Right. And And others. parents and everybody else. Yeah. It's 
unbelievable. I know. That time in our history is, is not a so shameful. Good one. So shameful. But That's, anyway. I really am intrigued with all of this type of history. Mm -hmm. I think it was fascinating. It's, I'm going to go home and look it up. Oh, get home today. Yeah, there's the documentary. The I'll see if I can post the link. It's really good. I got most of the information from the documentary. Thurgood Marshall, I knew what a great man he was, but I didn't know how intelligent and... What a difference he I, made. Exactly. I mean, I always knew he was a Supreme Court justice, yeah. but I never knew the, back, how he got the there whole story yeah. of Thurgood Marshall. Marshall. Mm -hmm. Well, that was Amazing really man. Um, Someone to look up to. So again, thanks to all you guys that listened to us to make our one year anniversary Woo! special. You rock. We love you. We Yeah, we, we do. Jennifer really loves you. I do. I do love them. Do you want to tell uh, the good folks where they can find us? You can find us on Twitter at Our True Crime Pod. We have a blog that we try to keep updated, which is our true crime podcast dot com. You can email us at our true crime podcast at gmail dot com. And we do have a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. You can sign up, be a member. We give out goodies and all sorts of stuff. We also have a one time donation button if you would like that you can go on our website and give us a donation through PayPal that way. And what else? I think that's about it. We're gonna, that's about us. getting ready to head to the True Crime Podcast Festival in Chicago. We'll send in pics four like days. we did before, and we'll put it on our Twitter and right. our blog and wherever else you can find us. That's right. Okay, Jen, here we go. You ready? Mm -hmm. This is uh, one year of saying this. One year. Well, sort of. We didn't come up with it until later, but go ahead. Remember, about one year. lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye. Love ya. watch Big Little Lies yet. Meryl Streep is such a bitch. She I is. love her. She oh is my a bitch. god. So Harry started to develop a passion for ex ecstasism. <laughs> Ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? I didn't know where that was going. <clears throat> Excuse me. On July 20th, the state attorney Jesse Hunter went before the grand journey. Journey? Journey. I love journey. Don't stop believing. Don't stop. Now the the bit Reg wants in the chair. There they find. He does. And then I'll do this. And then, come here. Come on, Tubby. Oh, <laughs> He's a mess. Big one. He's stinky, too. So, okay. All right. So my question is, I'm leaving this in. What does one do at a KKK meeting? I was thinking about this the whole time you were talking about this. Like, toast what, marshmallows? Like, what do they do? Tar toast okay, marshmallows? Okay, can we have uh, Leroy stand up and tell us about how we're going to go to the fair and pass out flyers? Like, how yeah. does that even work? One of the wizards got kicked out because he started going after Catholics. Oh, so they just don't <laughs> like black people? Jews, blacks, Hispanics. I thought it was anybody that wasn't. You know. White? Yes. No. They, it, it was brought in religion. But Catholics are but out. one of them absolutely could not stand Catholics, and they're like, oh, wait, this we, is doing we, too much hate. We, we, we stopped the It was all there. good until you come from the Catholics. Come Once you come for the Catholics, it's over. Oh, Lord. Isn't right. it? Yeah.